wanted him dead, he'd be dead already. Um, they would have killed him before taking him away. They wouldn't have taken him away. They just would have killed him, right? So they want his dad for some purpose. They don't know what it is, right? Okay. Um, and at the end of the last chapter, there was a ship coming. And right now, the beagle is stranded in space. Nobody's going past. Nobody's anywhere around. They're just sitting ducks out there, right? But suddenly, a ship appears, right? They're evil. Okay. So this chapter starts with an excerpt from a book. The pirates of today are not so different from the romanticized figures from our own sordid human history, the Blackbeards and Captain Kids. Yes, they pilot spaceships instead of boats, fire torpedoes instead of cannonballs, and wield energy blasters instead of flintlocks, but they are still misfits and miscreants, resorting to thievery and violence as their quest for fame and fortune, or simply as a way to survive. Dr. Jeffrey Harmon, Scurvy Dogs in Outer Space, Piracy in the Modern Age, Circa 2053. So that was published in 2053. The Ones Left Behind. Like every other 10-year-old kid he'd ever met, Leo was fascinated by outer space, right up until the moment his father told him that's where they were going, because that's when Leo realized he wasn't coming back. Back to the house on Briarwood Lane, Red brick front with the fireplace that still burned actual wood and doors you had to open by hand. An unmotorized swing set in the backyard near next to the hy hydroponic garden that produced plump tomatoes and blood red strawberries nurtured by a sun that still managed to pierce the polluted haze layered thick by the excavators working around the clock a hundred miles away. The driveway cracked and colored with chalk. It was the house Leo grew up in. The house he had lost his first tooth. Tucked, in his tucked it under his pillow in exchange for a crisp $10 bill. The same house where his mother once burned Thanksgiving dinner so badly it set off smoke alarms. It was the only home he'd ever known. Still, Leo might have gone quietly if it weren't for the cat, a charcoal-colored bundle of fur and mischief named Amos who had more toes than normal. He was still a kitten when Leo had been born, and the two had grown up side by side. Dr. Fender waited till the last minute to deliver the news, knowing it would break Leo's heart. I'm sorry, Leo. No pets on board. No, no way, Leo said, shaking his head for emphasis. He can come with. He can sleep in my bunk with me. He can eat my leftovers. He won't be any trouble. I promise. So what kind of literary device is this that we're reading right now? Flashback, right? This is not in our present storyline. This is a flashback to when he first got on the Beagle. Okay. Huh? What? Yeah, it's really called, the, called the beagle, but they can't have Oh. True. It must be like a, a musical instrument beagle. That means the beagle. I don't know. <sighs> there are rules. Besides, how's he going to chase birds on board a star cruiser? He'll be happier here, don't you think? I think we'd all be happier here, Leo protested. I don't see why we have to go. What followed was pouting. Crying, the shaming of the slamming of the bedroom door. An hour later, 10 year old Leo, red faced, defeated, slipped out in search of Amos, finding the cat happily napping in the backyard. He curled up next to it and scratched its scruff, eliciting a satisfied purr. He knew why. His father had explained it how his ship had literally come in, how the Akari recognized his contributions to advancing the practical application of Fantasium, and offered him a commission as a scientist officer aboard a vessel bound for other planets suspected of having significant deposits of the precious stuff. How this was his chance, their chance to contribute to the coalition's mission, the promise of peace and stability, not just on Earth, but across the entire galaxy. And Leo understood, sort of. But that didn't mean he had to like it. In fact, he swore not to. That evening, Amos deposited into the wrinkled hands of Mrs. Tinsley, the next door neighbor, who already had two cats of her own and who was too old to be shooting off into outer space anyhow. Instead, she and Amos would just curl up in that rocking chair and wait for the sky to fall, she said. Leo told her he'd rather stay and watch the sky fall too. His father told him to go and pack a suitcase. So now we're back on the spaceship. 
They bolted toward the bridge, Leo doing his best to keep in stride with his brother, heart hammering, already wheezing from the effort, until he saw Gareth pull up just outside one of the three entrances to the bridge, peering in. Leo squeezed his head in beside his brothers to get a better view. There stood Captain Sato the most, and most of the crew, each member wielding whatever they could find to use as a weapon. Pipes, knives, wrenches. Tex held a blowtorch in his blue, gr giant blue fist. Lieutenant Burke had a length of chain. They looked like one of those earth gangs from 100 years ago, the kind that would rumble in parking lots. The Jarek ra raiding party had stripped them of their real weapons, taking, with them, taking them along with the Ventasium cores. Only Captain Sato still had a gun, an old-fashioned pistol, bullets, not energy bolts, an artifact from another age. The crew made a wall shoulder to shoulder with their captain at the fore. Leo was about to join them when Gareth grabbed a fistful of shirt, pulling him back. Stay right here, out of sight. But we should... No, stay put. That's when it hit him. What his brother already knew. This wasn't a rescue ship. This wasn't his father somehow escaped from his Jarek captors, returning with, him, with help. If so, Captain Sato wouldn't be guarding the bridge with an antique handgun and a wrench-wielding posse of desperate crewmates. You sure it's not the Jarek? Leo fretted. Gareth didn't have an answer, but one came in the form of a booming voice echoing down the halls. Look at this! A welcome party! Definitely not Jarek. The translator chip implanted just behind Leo's ear did a fair job of turning alien speech to English, but you could always tell when it was filtered through the translator. No, the voice Leo heard was a human speaking Leo's own tongue. When he saw What he saw stepping through the main corridor onto the bridge was in fact two humans walking side by side, and just behind them, what is that? Leo whispered. Leo had come face to face with Akari and Jarek's ter Teratrin's Joel, and the Ad Adiran. He'd seen hollows and vids of dozens of other alien species, but the thing towering behind the two human intruders wasn't part of Leo's year-long unit on alien cultures. He surely would have remembered reading about this, a beast with a short snout on an ox-shaped head with two curled ram-like horns on either side. A thick neck n led to a hulking body, gorillian in bulk, and covered in a thick coat of mottled gray and brown fur. The creature walked slightly hunched on massive legs and had shrewd yellow eyes too small for its face. At the very least, Leo would have remembered the arms, all four of them. The creature was covered in a robe, a dingy white with the sleeves from its many appendages. The robe almost made the hulking creature comical, the way the alien scratched the back of its head with its lower left hand gave the impression that it had little interest in being there. Leo's eyes darted back to the two humans, dressed much differently from their four-armed companion. The dark-skinned female, who couldn't have been much too much older than Gareth, wore a stiff black tunic that stretched up her chin, brass buttons snapping it together, black trousers, and knee-high boots that clicked along the floor. A holster on the belt held a sleek-looking silver pistol, matching the silver of the cape that came down over, over only one shoulder, concealing most of her right arm but it was the girl's left arm that caught Leo's attention. Whereas the creature behind her had limbs to spare, half the girl's left arm was missing, replaced by a titanium prosthesis that started at her elbow and ended in a wicked-looking four-pronged claw, all metal, no skin. Her glossy black hair was pulled into a complicated braid that pendulated as she walked. She had to be the one in charge. It couldn't possibly be the man standing beside her, wearing raggedy blue jeans with patched knees and a pair of filthy high-top sneakers. He was older, close to Leo's father's age. His burnt orange hair was cropped short and tight. He wore a light leather jacket over a marooned colored t-shirt that said Dr. Pepper in slant script. The, the name sounded familiar. Something from an old song, maybe? Like the girl next to him, he was packing heat, two pistols riding in holsters on his hips. Only the monster in the bathrobe was unarmed, though Leo realized that wasn't the best choice of words. Leo knew immediately who they were, or at least what they were, carrying weapons but wearing no uniforms or insignias, clearly not Jarek, and definitely not Coalition, boarding a ship without permission, and sauntering right onto the bridge like they own the place. They could only be pirates. Leo sta started to say as much to Gareth, got out the pa before his brother's hand clamped over his mouth. Captain Sato kept her wet weapon pointed at the floor, her finger resting beside her trigger. Against a fully armored Jarek Marauder, bullets were the distraction at best, but a human in a tattered old t-shirt was a different story. Apparently, the three intruders thought so too, because they paused just inside the entry. The alien still scratched its head, its fur 
rippling. The commander of the Beagle got right to the point. I am Captain Sato of the Coalition Expedientiary Forces. This is my ship and you are intruders. I order you to set down your weapons immediately. The woman with the shoulder cape grunted. The man made a face as if he was considering the request before shrugging. I have a counteroffer, Captain Sato of the Coalition Expeditionary Forces. How about you put down the fossil of yours before you blow another hole in your hull and we have a friendly conversation like civilized human beings? The man's voice was cool and composed, any threat concealed in the holsters at his side, and a still bored looking giant standing behind him. Well, most of us anyways, he added. Leo studied all three of them, trying to gauge who was the most dangerous. Not the sloppily dressed man with the crooked smile. It was either the claw-handed girl with the annoyed look on her face or the hulking ape-like bruiser in the bathrobe. Regardless, there were only three of them against a crew of nearly 40. The Beagle had strength in numbers, but pirates were pirates, and if everything Leo had heard was true, they would sooner just take what they wanted rather than ask for it. Just like the Jarek. Leo knew the captain wouldn't want to risk the lives of any more of her crew. She would ta- talk her way out of it, out of this if possible. Who are you? What are your intentions? Sato asked, her voice steady as her as her voice as steady as the hand holding her gun.